In this episode of Mind Pump, we talk about why New Year's resolutions simply don't work. Now, we worked in the gym industry for uh, over two decades, and every single year in January, we would see a 50% increase in traffic. People would just come in to sign up to want to improve their health and fitness. The problem with that was the vast majority of them, something like 92% of them, would drop out within a few months. So if you're listening to this podcast and you're thinking, hey, I'm going to get back into the fitness and health lifestyle or I'm going to start working out or I want to lose weight, um, you we don't want you to be one of those bad statistics. We want to make sure that you can stick with it. So we talk about all the reasons why they typically don't work and what you can do about it. So we talk about setting goals, how to do that properly. Most people don't set goals the right way. They tend to make the goals too big or too general. We also talk about how to create new habits and behaviors. There are strategies to creating new habits like working out and eating right that will increase the likelihood of your success. We talk about how hard it is what you're trying to accomplish and how to make it much easier. We also talk about how you focus on behaviors rather than goals because, of course, behaviors are what cause the results to happen in the first place. We talk about changing your environment. That's a very important uh, thing that can make you successful. And we also talk about using the wrong metrics, the ways that you tend to gauge your success. We talk about the things you should be using to gauge your success that will lead to more long-term success. Uh, now, this episode is brought to you by Viori. Now, Viori is our favorite leisure wear company. Now, they make clothes for lifestyle and fashion, for outdoor use, yoga, sports, and fitness, and even surf. They have amazing clothes. We love the way they feel. They have a lifetime happiness guarantee. What, what this means, and this is insane now, you could buy uh, some of their clothes, and within the lifetime of owning them, if you don't want this, that pair of clothes anymore, if there's a hole in it, it doesn't work for you anymore, you can return it. Um, that's an insane guarantee, but Viori can do this because they are super high quality. Again, this is one of our favorite companies that we work with, and we have a mind pump discount for you. All you got to do is go to Viori Clothing, so that's V-U-O-R-I clothing.com forward slash mind pump and use the code that's listed on the page for 25% off. Also, one more thing I'd like to mention, uh, January, of course, a lot of people getting into, into working out. You may be one of these people. The number one goal is fat loss. Everybody wants to burn body fat and get leaner. Now, one of the most effective ways to do this in a short period of time is through high-intensity interval training. This is a fact. Now, the problem is a lot of people do this the wrong way. They lose the weight quickly, and then they gain it back. And part of the reason for this happening is their high-intensity interval training program is all wrong. It's not programmed properly. Now, ours is. We have a program called MAPS HIT. It does take advantage of the science of high-intensity interval training, but it also does so in a way that corrects muscle imbalances, works on strength, Basically, we do this the right way, so you get fast, effective, long-term results. Now, that program is 50% off. Here's how you get that massive discount. Go to mapshit.com, that's M-A-P-S-H-I-I-T.com, and use the code HIT50, that's H-I-I-T-5-0, no space, for the discount. What are those? Are those Viore right there? Yeah, they are, yeah. What, what is... Uh, what is the that's Viore? These are the right there. chinos. So, remember? Oh, those are the chinos. Yeah, dude. No, no, no. I thought I thought the chinos were more like the the lightweight. No. Oh, can you do a little turnaround for me? Spin around. Let me see your glutes. Let me see your glutes in those. Wow. Wow. Those are fantastic. If you wanted to see my uh, my chinos, I don't I don't want to leave them high and dry. Would you, know you say I mean? that the the chinos are the ones you had the most of? Yeah. 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 I have three pair. I'm the big Sunday jogger guy. Sundays are the best. Yeah, Sunday jog. You're wearing the, you're wearing the maroon ones. I don't have those yet. Yeah, there you go. Ooh, I would say of all the sponsors we mess with, probably we we rock Vi use Viore and rock Viore. I was providing my whole new clothes. wardrobe. You know? I don't need. To, I don't like buying clothes. Yeah, That's great for uh, this, this, me. it's been a good for us that you have something. to Hundred percent. You know what I mean? I mean, signing with Viore. Good look for us. The, it's probably why we're as big as we are now. Yeah, yeah. that was uh, the one thing. Yeah, it's <laughs> like everyone's like, I really like, like these he's, guys. He's perfect. 
but just something missing. So last mm. night, my buddy sends over my th- my uh, my three best friends were on a, th- a thread, and my he's, three best friends, they're my three best friends. Okay, go they ahead. send me over a a picture of Champion, and my buddy's like, I, I my buddy, you're like, oh, you film my name? <laughs> you're <guy."> like, <laughs> oh yeah, no, yeah, no, my yeah. my yeah. buddy you know this. My buddy prefaces it with, you know, I'm sure Adam, you you already know that Champion. He's all, but this is just coming across my desk for the first time. He's a high school principal, and he's totally out of style. He's been out of style for the last two decades. He's a good friend of mine. And he sends over the champion uh, sweaters. And he's like, dude, you guys know that these things are way... I was like, yeah, dude. I showed him I have a bunch in my closet. And I was showing him that. And I was telling him, I love it because it's I love watching companies that make... Make brilliant comeback. Yeah, comebacks and brilliant pivots. And uh, I, was, so I was sharing all these other brands that are like... That have came back. Um, like no fear? No. That has, <laughs> that's not, that's not, that's not. Like, Stussy? Stussy is. Yeah, Stussy. No, really? Bro, yeah. No, Stussy had one of their best banner years just a couple of years ago. Wow. Yeah, no. It's uh, So that made a huge... And I'll tell you why. So... They had a huge comeback. You and another brand that will trip you guys will trip on that you you should know because and maybe you what? too because your your dad yeah. was in construction. So you're a Janko guy. Car yeah. Carhartt. So Carhartt has been yeah. around since like 1890, and it's and if you're in the construction world, you're for you're for sure your dads yeah. have like their gear or whatever. But it, they are now popular with like the young generation that's coming up right now. Mm. And so I was telling my and my they buddy, want to feel manly, but so, not actually be manly. So my my two best friends who are completely <laughs> out of style, like, oh my god, dude, I got hella Carhartt stuff. I use it when I'm fishing all the time. And then my other and I was telling them about Patagonia making the huge comeback, also, which they also were aware of that. And I said, you know, it's so funny. You've been out of style for so long that it's it's gone away cycled back around that you're back in style again. what's that saying uh, it's perfect uh, what's that saying a broken there you go. You a got, broken clock is is, uh, is right twice a day yeah twice a day you guys yeah. you've seen this you've seen this right yeah i have uh-huh. see my dad we were gangster dude we didn't you wouldn't buy yeah, anything i was wearing dickies and car hearts and all that no shit. my dad yeah. wore whatever he wore and to the point where he would wear jeans until they were basically disintegrated yeah. then what he would do is he would cut them so that they became shorts for the summer when you work in the summer except yeah, that's great growing up in sicily in those days I guess they grow our short ass shorts. So he wears short ass <laughs> jean shorts. He went for the booty shorts. Bro, huh? and they were frayed at the bottom. And I wow. was like, which doesn't style. Like, that, that would do well in San Francisco. I was like, Dad, you can't yeah, wear that. Back. Yeah. It's back. It's back. You know, that, but that, that, I, I, leg. Yeah, you can't bend down and grab your tools and, you know. No, so you got to watch out. Point of me sharing that is I think that uh, Viore has saved the podcast. I really do. I think that uh, then getting you in style has, has helped us. They have. Yeah. Thank, thank the Lord. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. 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 Anyway, we need to be presentable. Well, we're dealing with the New Year rush. That we've all dealt with for I don't know how many years have you guys dealt it with? It never the, goes away. Yeah, like how, do you guys remember? The, okay, this is a good one. Do you remember the first time you experienced the New Year rush in the gym? Oh remember, yeah, do you remember mm-hmm. that? For first mm-hmm. January, very yeah. first January, I worked in a gym. What it's year was really that? the so, cardio machines. Two thousand and one. Two thousand and one. Yeah, because yeah, I got hired in two thousand, but I got hired in the I think it was like August, so it wasn't until two thousand until the year came around. And I remember getting hired and everyone telling me like, oh, just wait. Because August, September, October, November, if you're in fitness and you're working for a big company, those are like the down months, which was probably- Especially November and December. (laughs) Which was probably one of the best things that happened for me because I was a new guy coming in and I didn't know any better. And so I was working to try and drum up business and everybody else is probably checking out. You know, everybody, yeah. all the other trainers have been around for decades. They're just like, fuck like, this. Ah, it'll come back yeah, in January. Yeah, this is where we take vacation. They don't mm-hmm. give a shit. And I'm over here like hustling, like trying to f- build my business. And I think that August, September, October, November, December, working like that and really trying to f- like learn the ropes was probably what set the table for a lot of the success that I had because then you hit January and January you could be blind <laughs> and hit it out the park. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you, you know, say in the fit, yeah. like people walk in like I need a trainer, yeah. like, I need tripping to, over each other, especially back in two thousand oh, credit big, card before the big crash. Yeah, so I don't remember exactly when I started. I think I started in it was, was ninety seven, maybe towards the middle of ninety seven because that's when I turned eighteen. So right when I was eighteen, I went and got a, a job at the gym, and everybody would talk about January how crazy it was. Now, nobody told me that the first week of January is basically an extension of December. Right, right. So yeah. nobody told me that. So everybody's like, oh my God, January's crazy. I remember this too. And by, You're sti- like, where is it? Now, statistically speaking, uh, gym, uh, gyms will see about a 40 to 50, sometimes 60% increase in traffic and revenue. Um, and that's pretty consistent. That's what I would experience in all the gyms that I, that I ran. You would see a 50% jump over what your normal uh, you know, sales would be, which is massive that's huge right yeah. so everybody's like january's crazy january's crazy 
December slow. So January first comes in. I come into the gym. I'm a kid, right? So I know I don't know yeah. any better. I show up and it's dead. Yeah. Yeah. Second dead. Third dead. Yeah. But do you remember? Okay. So it's dead. But then you know the following week. My, Nuts. The, the first sign was I, I go to get my normal parking spot and I get there at the same time every time. There is not a parking space to be had. No. Not only that, everybody's fighting each other for it and they're all fighting their way through to the front. And then you see lines waiting for the treadmill. That that's I'm like, what's happening? Yes, I remember. I would give, I would walk through the gym, and there were point, especially prime time, which is busy anyway. But prime time in mid January, when it's starting to kick into high gear, I'm walking through certain portions of the gym the same way you walk through a, a nightclub. Yeah, you know how you walk through a nightclub where you got to walk sideways and <laughs> kind of squeeze through people. Yeah, you kind of just shimmy through everybody. I, and I was like, "Wow, this is exciting." Or shoulder them, right, Justin? Yeah, you shoulder. <laughs> yeah. That's usually what I did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but I, I remember thinking, "This is noob. This is really <laughs> exciting." February also pretty busy. A yeah. little bit of it. It goes down a little bit, but Very still little. pretty busy. February, Mar all the way till March. March, I feel like. and then all of a sudden in April, y you see this it really starts to slow down, and it's a pretty dramatic slowdown. By the time you get to summer. Most of the crowd that you saw in January was Thinned was out. gone, yeah. was totally gone. Now, as a new trainer, I experienced this as well. And I always did well getting new clients, but I remember how easy it was in January. People would walk in with their wallets in their hands. Please train me. I want to get in shape right away. I want to lose 30 pounds or 40 pounds. I want to get in shape. And you would just sign them up and you do your you know your typical, well, if you buy 40 sessions, you get, well, I'll buy 40 sessions or whatever. But then you would see in the summer – you'd have to start working again. Mm -hmm. Now, I had to go through probably, I'd say, three or four years of that cycle to start to realize that I was a shitty trainer. Yeah. Like, I'd yeah. sign all You're these- You're just a piranha. Yeah. You know, preying I, off these people. I would just sign up so many people, and then they'd all stop. Yeah. yeah. I'd sign them, and they'd stop. And I'd sign them up, and they'd stop. And I'm like, wait a minute. I'm not helping anybody at well, all. That's because New Year's resolutions don't work. No. You know, statistically speaking, less than 10%. It's like 8%. Yeah, actually stick with a New Year's resolution. That's crazy. So more than 90% of what everybody is saying right now that they're going to do in 2020 yeah. doesn't happen whatsoever. And I think there's reasons behind that. 100%. 100 and it took me a long time to really put that all together, to realize that it, that's just not... Because when I first was training for the first five years or so... That was what I thought got people in shape. I thought it was all about making a big goal, getting motivated, getting inspired, coming in, getting crazy, making a big decision, and let's change everything today. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the way I thought about it. Now, part of the reason why I thought about that, thought things were that way, was because fitness came easy to me because I loved it so much. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was like, of course, that's just the way you got to do it. You just got to change everything. Yeah, but don't you, think really fine. don't you think that's one of the biggest problems in our space is that so many trainers uh, approach um, the way they train clients and the way they speak to clients the same way they think. One hundred percent. Yes. And you're you're into it. Like you 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 fell into it as a career. Therefore, you like this shit. And the reality is that the majority of people, especially in January time, that are coming in to hire a personal trainer to work out, don't really fucking want to be there. No. You know, and and the reason it's why it's like punishment, though. right? And the reason why they hire you is because they don't want to think about anymore. It's like I I did the hardest part. I got here. Mm -hmm. I got here. I know I need to make change in my life. It's my New Year's resolution. Here I'm going to hire my personal trainer, and then the trainer goes about their approach in a similar fashion that they probably taught themselves on how to get fit. Yeah, that's yeah it, they're there because it's like I, I feel like I'm I, I'm supposed to be here. You know, it's like I, I've, everybody tells me I need to change this and that. And it, a lot of times it's not even their own idea. It's like it, they fall into this. Well, I probably should do this. Mm -hmm. I should sign up. I, But they haven't really owned that specific uh, goal that they're trying to achieve. I remember there was a moment where so, some of this really started to click to me because I would. And if you're a trainer listening right now, this is how you know that you're not uh, approaching this the right way with your clients. <clears throat> if it just doesn't make any sense. OK, and here's let me explain what, what I mean. I would. Talk to people who come in who would need to lose, you know, 40 pounds of body fat or who had terrible movement patterns or had poor health. And I would think to myself, how? This doesn't make any sense. How can you not do this? How can you allow yourself to get to this poor health? And to me, it was just insane. It made no sense whatsoever. And at one point, I thought to myself and I said, hold on a second. This is most people. I need to figure this out. I need to figure out why this is so hard. I need to figure out. I need to get in their mind rather than trying to get them into my mind. I need to understand 
the behaviors and the psychology around what's going on. Otherwise, I'm never going to be able to help these people in a real way. So l- let's list uh, the top reasons why New Year's resolutions are not successful, and then let's give the solution to those. Okay, number one, hundred percent, is your your goals are too damn big and too damn general. We talk about this on the show a lot. A yeah, lot, we do. We do a lot. You, well, it needs to be talked about a lot. Now, now, now. First off, before we get into why that doesn't work, let's talk about why that happens in the first place. If you're in a motivated, inspired state of mind, the goals you're going to set tend to be lofty, lofty yeah. big goals. So it's like if you watch this like motivational, you know, f- film on business, or you go to this like business summit, you know, you're going to set some big ass goals right when you get home. That's it. I'm going to become a millionaire by the end of the year. I'm going to work, you know, 80 hours a week. I'm a- the that's the worst. What you have to do is judge the goals based off of your least, your lowest amount of motivation, and inspiration. So we have to be honest with yourself. Am I super motivated and inspired right now? Yes. Okay. I'm going to put myself in the mindset of what I, how I, I can be, which is very low motivation. Now let me set a goal based off of that. Not only ge- not only that, uh, but they're also too general. So they're lofty and they're vague. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm, you know, get, people don't get real- in shape. Yeah. People don't realize, yeah, get in shape or eat healthy yeah. is not- How are you tracking that? Is not specific enough. It's too vague, too big, too general of a goal for you to have a lot of success. And that's not to say, because there's- about 8% people that it does work for. Mm-hmm. But the 92% of you, that's a problem. And you got to figure out how to be more specific about exactly what your goal is. Right, right. So, uh, you know, setting, and in fact, as a trainer, when people would come to me and say, and I'd ask them, you know, what's your goal? What are your, your fitness goals? And they would say things like, oh, I want to get in better shape. Um, I would have to ask a lot more questions. Mm-hmm. I would never let that slide. You know, in fact, one of the funny things I used to do to kind of, you know, loosen people up is they'd say, I want to get in shape. And I'd say, well, a circle is a shape. Is that what do you mean? By, what do you mean you want to get in shape? You know, an amoeba and, is a shape. Yeah, yeah. And, and we would and we would start to go. Okay, like. how does that? What do you? How does <laughs> yeah, that? So you recite you recite a lot of clients like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> totally. How does that? How does that look for you? What exactly does that mean? Does that mean you want to lose weight? Does that mean you want to be stronger? Does it mean now let's prioritize all of those goals? I would go even further. Why? Right. You know, I I think understanding the motivation behind. Uh, your general vague goal is even more important mm. than than first fin- figuring out this. If you di- if you dig deep enough, you can figure out why their motivation is what it is and why they're there, which I think is important that you unpack that all the way down to your deepest insecurities. Then from there, once you first recognize that, which I think is extremely important, then you set very specific, small, obtainable goals to build momentum. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So before you can lose 30 pounds, you lose... Five pounds. Why don't we set that as your first goal? Before you can jog on the treadmill for 30 minutes, you need to be able to jog on it for five minutes. Why not set that as your first goal? Set very small, very, very realistic, and you have to be honest with yourself, goals and start there. Now, why is that more effective? It's more effective because it builds confidence. It builds a lot of confidence. I mean, I even like to distill it even further than like a, a pounds on the scale thing and say things like, hey, I just came off of at least most people right now that are rushing into the gym, bare minimum have been off for a minimum of one to three months, mm-hmm. the holidays, right? Bare minimum or longer. Most is years. Right, year right, 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 right. Exactly. So I, I even like to start with, let's forget about the, the total weight loss goal that you want or the muscle or speed or whatever whatever you're chasing. How about just like set a goal that, hey, what I'm going to do is every week I'm going to dedicate one to three hours of, of fitness, whatever that is. And, mm-hmm. and it, it can encompass the gym. It can encompass a hike. It could be taking a class. It could be anything, but but set it so realistic that you're keeping in mind that this is something that I could do forever for the rest of my life. And if three to five times a week, you, you say to yourself, well, I've never in my life consistently worked out in a gym three to five times. Why would you start there? Mm-hmm. That's the worst thing you could do. If you know, you already know your own patterns and behaviors, then, then distill it even further down and 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 start with something as, as it has basic. to be somewhat familiar you know it has to be something that's not too foreign like I mean if if you are trying to press yourself out uh, you know like do it really slowly do it really gradually so that way you know you're really uh, finding yourself uh, 
you know, more inclined to, to go in that direction. I, I think like if you're trying to do something completely different, you have to approach it as, as you know, like I need enough time to really understand like what that looks like yeah. in my new lifestyle. Yeah. Nobody makes, it's actually quite rare to make massive, uh, fundamental, uh, long lasting, lifelong changes in who you are, uh, in a very short period of time. The only times that that tends to happen when you actually look at the the literature is either a spiritual people have a spiritual experience, or they have a life altering, uh, you know, traumatic uh, type of an experience. So it's like the the person who's forty pounds overweight has a heart attack. That may actually serve. By the way, I've met a lot of people who that's happened to, and it still didn't work. But that may, for some people, be the impetus for dramatic lifestyle change. Um, other than those types of things, the spiritual, you know, like, oh my gosh, I, you know, I, I saw God or, oh crap, I almost died or almost killed someone or whatever. Changes happen gradually over time. Transformations happen, you know, like a, like a, when, when you, when you see a, a you know, a, a caterpillar turn into a butterfly, it goes in a cocoon. There's, there are gradual changes that happen. You, at the end, you see the emerging of the butterfly, but what you don't see is the gradual changes inside the, the cocoon. And that's how most uh, changes happen. Adam, you talked about uh, changing the types of goals. You know, I call that you know, pressing behaviors. Uh, rather than looking at the result and pushing the result, why don't we push the behaviors that lead to the result? Mm. That's a far, by the way, that's a very effective strategy, regardless of what your goal is. I don't care what your goal is. If you press the behaviors, are far more likely to achieve the goal than if you just press the goal. So rather than saying, I want to, my goal is to lose 30 pounds, you say, my goal is to make it to the gym twice a week a week, right, every yeah. single week. Right. Or my goal is to eat you know, uh, vegetables twice a day uh, rather than you know, once every other day like I normally do. Rather than saying, I'm just going to eat healthier or I'm just going to change you know, my whole mm -hmm. diet type mm -hmm. of deal. A another mistake that I see is people not attaching this to another current habit. And I love to teach this because it reminds me of the mistake that I see people make in business. A lot of times people make these massive pivots from a, a, a type of business they're running to doing something completely opposite or different than what they're currently in. And when I when I know when I see people that are doing this, I, I, I recommend to them a lot that listen, if you're thinking about making a shift from your current industry, try and make a pivot that allows you to still do kind of what you're doing and build off of that. That way it kind of protects you. And the similar psychology applies to when we're trying to lose weight or build muscle, instead of just trying to create something that's a brand new habit that you've never done, try and build upon something that you've already currently done. For mm -hmm. example, let's say you're a, a business person and you're really good about getting up an hour and a half early every day to have your coffee and read the newspaper. Well, nobody reads the newspaper anymore. Read your favorite article. <laughs> right, that was a terrible analogy. Yeah. Read, read your, you On know, their iPad. Ride, ride your brontosaurus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Sorry, terrible analogy. But you, for me, like Riddle I get some up, sticks. And I get up, I, you know, when I'm when I'm uh, when I'm on fire, right? I feel like I, I get up a good hour and a half, two hours before I have to be at work, and I I read, I meditate, I do all these things that that enhance. Uh, the current business, the current thing that I'm doing, that has nothing to do with my fitness. It has everything to do with, you know, being better at my job and and making more money. At which some people have already created good habits in that. So, look into the things that you've done really well and you've created good habits like that, and now start to attach mm -hmm. something that's going to benefit you in the health and fitness world. So, for example, if maybe I'm somebody who wasn't very fit, but I've been really good about getting up early in the morning and doing this, you know, meditating or reading or preparing my work day. Maybe now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do those so th those same similar things, but with a half hour or an hour walk. Mm -hmm. So now I'm going to put in my ears an audio book or maybe listen to the Wall Street Journal instead of reading it on my phone. I'm going to put it in my ears and I'm going to go take a walk for a half hour, an hour. What's beautiful about that is you've already created a habit that you were doing already consistently. It's become a behavior you of yours. You just attach it to it. You've now attached something that's related to health and fitness, or just attach an additional 10 to 15 or 30 minutes to that already time that you've already started to schedule out for yourself, you'll have so much more success. Yeah, it's a, another work. example would be like if you walk your dog you know, every day, maybe go an extra 10 or 15 minutes every single day. Exactly. Yeah. Just adding to, uh, you know, or you know, you brush your teeth before you go to bed. Maybe you know, when you brush your teeth, right after you brush your teeth, you do some push-ups and some crunches. You know, mm -hmm. marketers actually uh, have identified that this is a very powerful strategy. This is one of the yeah they call those cues too. <laughs> yeah, oh. it's, it's, it's a part of uh, you know creating the and establishing those better rituals. Mm -hmm. So it is like yeah if 
if this, like if I'm doing this or I'm in this specific environment, in this place, like I'm going to do this many pushups, mm -hmm. you know? And it's like, like finding those opportunities in your house and like seeing I'm in this room. So therefore I'm going to do this specific thing every time I pass this room. This oh. is a, this is a very common tool that uh, along the lines of what you're talking about, Justin, I, that I had a lot of success with is I used to go to like Staples and buy uh, a, a bunch of st circle stickers and they have, I'm pretty sure they still have these. And they're just like colored circle stickers, red, blue, green, like all these different circles. And it, each one of them, I would, I would, and for the client, depending on who they are and what, what I want them to focus on, I would make a, a color sticker stand for something. So like, you know, blue for them would be a one minute plank. You know, a, a red sticker would be 10 squats. Uh, and I'd have these these things that I want that client to do that are very simple, only take them maybe a minute or two to do. And then I would have them strategically place it throughout their house, especially if I had a client who worked from home or in their office and you have them, oh, the refrigerator. So every time you walk by that and you make eye contact with that dot, I want you to do 10 squats. You know, simple things like that, because these are ha habits, behaviors you've already created, you do all the time, or your computer screen, every time you log into a certain page or whatever, you make sure that you do whatever exercise or movement pattern. A lot of times I love to address correctional stuff with this. If I have a client that has upper cross syndrome and I'm mm -hmm. trying to work on their posture and maybe band pull apart to something I'm trying to get them in the habit of doing multiple times per day, I have them put these stickers throughout places I know that they're going to be traveling and seeing multiple times a day and that that just makes them do that. It's especially effective. I've had clients do that when like they're waiting for the shower to warm up and they're just doing like a wall test and like simple mobility things with their shoulders just to get them prepped for then, you know, promoting them to to, to do activities and ex exercises as a result of, you know, after going through their morning ritual. Yeah, some of the good, the greatest success I've had with friends and family members was doing what you guys are saying and what that led to was them eventually going to a gym. Right. Uh, so, so what we're talking about are behaviors that you can attach to current behaviors. And most of these don't involve you going to the gym. So if you're just getting started, if you're not working out at all, you do these, like you, if you tend to watch TV at night, for example, let's say every night I like to watch, you know, an hour worth of TV. Well, while you're sitting there, why not do foam some roll or something. foam roll or do some stretches or do some exercises? Yeah, it's super effective. While you're brushing your teeth, why not do some squats or attach? And it, this is scientifically proven, by the way. This is a very proven way to create new habits. And you think to yourself now, Here's what may be happening. You may be listening to this podcast and may be thinking, well, that's not a lot. That's not enough. I'm not doing anything. Bullshit. First, yeah. First off, it's way more than what you're doing now. So it's more than you're doing now. Number two, this is how you lead yourself to the point where you are doing more. It keeps adding up. It keeps adding up. Now, what will end up happening is at some point, if you're consistent with these behaviors, at some point, you're going to want to go to a gym because you're like, I, I think I want to do more. It's funny. I, you know, in that back half of my training career when I would train clients, I would talk them into only coming to see me once a week if they'd never worked out. That was often, that was a conversation we'd have. And then I'd wait. I'd train them once a week and I'd wait. I'd wait for them to tell me right. they'd want to come in more. And inevitably, after five or six months of that consistent once a week, they'd say, you know, I think I can do one more day a week. Well, mm -hmm. you, when you think about the number, one of the number one objections that people have to getting fit is time. Mm -hmm. and, and, and making time separate from what their busy life already yeah, is. It's adding more. So a really good right. a really good trainer figures this out that okay, if that's my number one objection and I'm constantly seeing it all the time. And if I'm constantly arguing with those people, like some young trainers do, like you can make time. Okay, well that's not the approach. And that you see that you always can tell a really young trainer when they when they do something like that, when it's like, you know, oh they math they mathematically figure out the time and they say, oh you can make the time. The right. better approach is how can I look at your current lifestyle? What are you doing right now that you already have habits? And how can I start to attach little bits of, of health and fitness and things that will make a positive impact on your overall big goal that you set for yourself and then build upon it? And because what will happen is exactly what Sal is, is, was alluding to, which is, you know, I know they said when they first came to me, oh, I want to go five days a week or whatever. But you're like, no, 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 no. Let's, let's start with something slow, one, two days, whatever. And eventually they come to you like because they're on fire. They've been going for the last three, four weeks consistently. They're seeing progress. They feel great. Look, they want more. All all skill. By the way, working out consistently, regularly, having a healthy diet, um, think of it as any other behavior or skill. If you've never ridden a bike before, you're not going to jump on a, a, a mountain bike and go downhill. You're just not. You start with training wheels, right? That's the, that's the only way to progress to the point where you can do the downhill, you know, mountain bike, uh, you know, riding. Same thing with fitness. 
you got to start very, very slow, which takes me to the next difficult thing or, or, or challenge, which is people pick the most difficult things to do, the most difficult <sighs> goals. Yeah. It's like, okay, you know, you haven't worked out for 10 years and your goal is to lose 50 pounds. Okay, that's really freaking hard. Why don't we start with something oh, really easy? Fast and, qu and, and quick results, is, it's just so attractive. You know, like everybody wants to get there the fastest way possible. And that's like just a condition that your average person has. And, now, and, it, and this is this is a very hard mentality to break. That's now, one of the first disciplines. Now, here's the deal. Theoretically, you could get fast results and then keep those results. Theoretically. Behaviorally speaking, it just never works. Almost. I have. I can't honestly, off the top of my head, I can't think of a single client among the hundreds that I've trained and the thousands they have the studies for it. Yeah. 90 percent 92 percent don't yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. Already yeah. It's, already, it's already there it's already there yes there's a eight percent or so that actually do that figure it out for themselves for whatever reasons but the other 90 plus percent don't I would bet that those eight percent are the epiphanies that I talked about of earlier course. the people that came in with the health scares yeah. or the big things or you know they they, they you know they had real grandkids life changing they, events or something that, that that changed the course exactly exactly so it's that slow and steady approach and start really really easy uh, in order to you know make that happen oh what's that say Doug up there oh yeah look at that that article six years after the Biggest Loser people's they're the people on the Biggest Losers metabolism is slower and their weight is back up I'm glad you brought that up Doug because Dang. that brings me to another <laughs> part of this which is and 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 not to scare you okay I don't want to frighten you but if you're in the lose weight fast and then gain it back, which is what happens to most people when they do it real quick. Here's what happens to your body. Mm. When you lose weight fast, you lost the body fat, meta your metabolism adjusts. It starts to adjust, right? And, and it's called metabolic adaptations. Your metabolism will slow down a little bit. There's not a problem. Now, if you're lifting weights, this is very minimal. Sometimes you may even speed it up. But now let's say you go off your nutrition. You go off that diet that you were on. You stop working out and you start gaining weight back. Each time you do that, your body actually captures, uh, starts to create more fat cells, makes it more difficult each time you do this. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason why your body is adding fat cells, the theory, the theory is, is that it's trying to figure out how to capture all those calories. It's starting to become yeah. more efficient at gaining the weight back. Each time you do that, it becomes like, more oh, efficient. Oh, no, we're in a state of famine. Let's like make sure we keep all this energy. Oh, it's gonna go, they're going to starve yeah, themselves gonna, again. Right. So they, they, it, your body attempts to capture more and more calories or actually becomes better at getting fat. So not only uh, are the odds that you'll gain the weight back higher if you do this super fast, crazy, all-out approach, but you'll actually make it, if you when you gain the weight back, as, as like we said, 92% of you will, you'll gain, a, you'll gain the weight back, and each time you do that, your body gets better at getting fat and it gets worse at getting lean. Well, and this is the biggest bone that I have to pick with the high-intensity group classes is they attract these people that you know want something hard because hard they equate to faster results and they gravitate towards the orange theory the F45 the crossfit classes does that not does that mean that there's a small percentage of people that could have success with that no of course there are some people uh, the, the anomalies that it ends up being beautiful for them in a lifestyle and for years later, those are the people that end up drinking the Kool-Aid and then preaching about it to everybody else why it's so great because it worked for them. The problem is they're the fucking minority. Mm -hmm. The majority of people, it's an awful way to start your fitness school, to go into some intense class where you sweat like crazy and you push really, really hard because you feel like that's what you need to do. And it's this, it's this punishment thing that I think a lot of clients fall into when they feel guilty for all the weight that they put on over the holidays or not working out for the last couple of years. And so they gravitate towards these classes. And it's like this, it's like a uh, misery loves company. We're all these, we're all suffering together mm -hmm. to go after this goal. And the reality of it is, you know, even if you see pretty good results for the first few weeks, it's not a good strategy for long-term results. No, it's funny. In fact, if you run classes or you have a gym and January comes around, what you tend to do is increase the amount of so here's here's what you think you would do right you think knowing you're going to get a bunch of new people in you're going to boost the amount of beginners classes and you're going to boost the amount of you know trainers working with you know doing like kind of low intensity getting right. people started one on ones the the opposite actually happens gyms actually boost the amount of high intensity classes and the trainers who are advertising the hardest workouts are the ones that tend to gather the most attention mm -hmm. because the attitude is I'm inspired. I'm motivated. I, I'm mm -hmm. sick of myself. I need this to happen tomorrow. 
So really what we're talking about is a change in mindset because if your mindset is going in the way that we're talking about, your chances of success are, are actually very, very low. Me uh, in the opposite, that means you're just going to get, you're going to fail. So you want to start off uh, very, very slow. I want to go back to uh, focusing on behaviors rather than goals because I think that's such an important, that is such a key thing to learn to do um, to achieve long-term success with fitness and health, really. Rather than saying, I'm going to you know, bench press 300 pounds, uh, it's better to say, I'm going to practice bench pressing twice a week. Mm -hmm. uh, rather than saying, I'm going to you know, lose 30 pounds of body fat, I'm going to say, I'm going to eat you know, one-fourth less food. I'm going to keep my food. That was a great strategy I had with clients. In fact, I would not have them change their diet. And once we were at the point where we could start to cut calories, I would say, hey, we're not going to change your diet at all. I just want you to eat one-fourth less. Let's just start with that and see what happens. Because I felt like that was an easier way for people to reduce calories. And, and that was a behavior. It wasn't, hey, we're going to get you to lose weight. It was, hey, let's, let's rather than eating till you're full, why don't you eat until you're just satisfied, which usually resulted in about a quarter uh, less intake. Those behaviors are what caused the results uh, and the goals. Focusing on the goals does not change necessarily the behaviors. Well, along those lines, this is where I really like this. is, And this took me at least a decade before this really came together. And I've said it on the show multiple times is I even like when, when looking at the nutrition is uh, instead of restricting or taking away is like just a goal of adding something. So it's much easier. Everybody, everybody I've ever. Yeah. Naturally re replaces things that way. Had them track for a week or two and assessed their current eating habits. Everybody is missing somewhere. Like when you, when you eat a lot of processed foods or eat bad food or drink alcohol or do these, these, what we call empty calories, it, you're going to be missing somewhere else that you need something nutritionally. Yeah, most people don't drink a lot of alcohol and drink a lot of water. Right, right. <laughs> or a right. lot of you know a lot of ho hos and a lot of vegetables. Right, right. Or get yeah. or get a ton of fiber while they're eating all this right. other. So that's mastery level. So you so you look at the as a a, a good trainer can look at a, a diet or look at the way somebody is, is consuming and see where they're missing nutrients, not where they're over. It's very easy. They know they're over. They already know they're over consuming. They're eating fucking alcohol or they're drinking alcohol all the time or they're eating fast food all the time. They know they're overeating. That's not you're you're not going to enlighten them by doing that. A good trainer can look at their diet and see where they're lacking nutrients. Maybe it's fiber. Maybe they're not getting enough healthy protein. Maybe they're not getting enough healthy fats. Like, and then go, okay, let me pick a meal or pick a food group that this person's not getting enough of, and I'm going to give them a goal of inserting that daily. Mm -hmm. And what's beautiful is that when you do that, instead of taking it away or restricting them, what ends up happening is it does replace something. You tell somebody who Naturally. never never drinks water and only drinks Cokes, juices, and alcohol that, hey, you got to drink a gallon of water a day, yeah. but I'm not going to tell you anything else. Like Before you know it, they can't consume another uh, another fluid. because so having... Yeah, it's just like protein and fats. Like It's more satiating. Right. So like if I focus more on like going out to, to make sure that I'm rotating these different types of meats and things in my diet, a lot of times that's going to take up, you know, a lot of the calories uh, just because they're so satiated. Oh, just tell people to hit their protein targets and, yeah. and, and watch them naturally because uh, eating, right. you know, uh, adequate protein for muscle building, which tends to be about, you know, half a gram to a gram per pound of body weight and average weight uh, individuals, you, you, you don't want, you, you just, it's more food. It's a lot more food. It You're is. not going to be able to eat as much of the other stuff. Now, I'm sure there are the occasional people who are like, I'll do it all. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. typically, from what our, from our experience, it changes that. Then there's also these types of behaviors. I like to go even a little bit deeper, and I'll say things like, uh, don't watch TV while you eat. That's all. Uh -huh. let's, just, let's just start with that. Don't right. watch TV while Great you eat. Goal. Yeah. Or don't be on your phone. It's that mindless eating. Yeah. That's it, while you That's eat. Or addressing. sit down, chew your food very, very well, put your fork down in between bites and just do that. Oh, I love, I yeah. love the, after you eat, make your 10 minute walk. That's I love, it. I love, yeah. I mean, see, there's yeah. attaching, there's attaching right. a, a habit to another habit. Right. You, you, you habitually, obviously we all eat on a regular basis and most people have a specific dinner time, give or take 30 minutes to an hour. They always eat dinner. You've already, that's already a created habit in your lifestyle. Now, instead of uh, the, the current thing that you probably do at the dinner, which is lay on the couch and click the clicker and look at TV or whatever it is that you do or lay down and take a nap or whatever afterwards, instead of that, now attach a nice 10 minute walk yeah. and start there. And maybe that 10 minute walk eventually turns into a 30 minute walk and maybe an hour minute walk, or maybe that ends up going to a gym or doing something else down the road, but start 
by attaching to already a, a again a, a behavior of eating dinner every single night, some sort of health and fitness thing. Well, along those lines too, I found myself uh, like I, I created this own goal for myself to not try to wash down every bite with with something you know water, you know beverage, something like that while I was eating, and that just forced me like naturally forced me to chew my food down to its bits so that way you know i could pro i could get it down because I, I had a problem where it would like i, I would choke and <laughs> you know i would like really shovel it down fast i know i'm not alone i oh, know I there's the a lot thing. of people that will you know have that mentality when they go to eat they're just kind of shoveling it in and you know that was like huge for my digestion i mean I, at night i had a whole lot less you know gastrointestinal issues like it just it helped things move along much better that that reminds me of the the switch hand method that i used to have clients do for that exact reason and really what this is is just becoming more self-aware the and stranger the, yeah, the yeah. Stranger. <laughs> not that yeah. not that although no, they, for eating yes yeah. for eating the stranger right? for that eating. too right you 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 eat with your right hand, then the next the next time you eat with your left hand. So every time you shovel food into your mouth, you know it's funny. People, I guarantee people listening right now, are like that's silly. It is proven. It well, is a proven strategy, and well, it's a behavior. It, here, and here's why: because most people are, are mindlessly eating and so unaware Correct. of how they eat. And just just pay attention the next time you eat, how often you're already got the next bite ready while you're still chewing the last bite. Oh, that's that's yeah. the that's the hallmark of uh, of mindless eating. That's the hallmark of even binging is it's not about the food that you're enjoying. It's about the next bite. It's always about the next bite. So, think about that right now. Think about the last time you ate you you ate too much of a meal. Think about the last time you ate too fast uh, or you overate. And now think about that. You weren't enjoying the food as you were chewing it. You had the food in your mouth and you were like, I need to get the next one in. And so it was about how fast I can get the, this bite down, which is what Justin said, wash it down so I can get the next one. Mm -hmm. So it's really not about enjoying food. It's really about this impulsive behavior for getting more and more. Right. Slowing yourself down by switching hands, placing the fork down, not drinking. That was a big one for me, uh, Justin. I, I don't drink water when I yeah. eat now, which forces me to chew. It's tough, man. It actually causes you to be more mi mindful. And here's the side effect of that. You enjoy your food more or well, you actually pay attention to and it. And you're yeah. less likely to overeat. Totally, 100%. And, and these are the types of ways that you... These goals, these are so much more obtainable and realistic. And the beauty of it is you become more aware, you start to attach it to other things, and this becomes a lifelong thing that you do that ends up adding. It may it seem like it may seem so silly to somebody who's super motivated right now to go to the gym and crush it mm -hmm. that oh gosh I'm going to switch hands when I eat or I'm going <laughs> to stop drinking water. That's stupid. Nobody's advertising. How many this. calories does that actually burn, I, and how much I, muscle is that actually going to build? You know, I find that so funny. It's like you know, imagine if you're a big, you're a 25 year old, 35 year old uh, who's never done you know karate before, and you walk into a karate school. Are you an idiot because you have to practice? the very basic moves before you can move up to the next moves? Of course not. That's the way right. everybody pro progresses. So don't compare yourself to fitness fanatics or to your fitness ideal. That's a, that's a You're not being fair to yourself. It would be like me going to a, a karate gym and I'm like, I'm going to be Chuck Norris tomorrow. <laughs> not not going to happen. It's, it's not fair. It's a slow process. And doing these small things that we're talking about, as silly as they sound, um, and I'm going to say this right now, trust us and try it. We've trained people for, for over two decades. This is what leads to long-term success, which actually leads me to another thing that, uh, again, this took me a long time to put together, which is change your environment. Ooh, one of the biggest- Hard one. One of the biggest mistakes people make yep. with these New Year's resolution goals that fail is that they fail to change their environment. So what does that mean? Well, that means a lot of different things. Here's one of them. Um, if your environment involves you being around a lot of heavily processed, highly palatable you know, foods and wrappers and bags, yeah. good luck. Good luck making those changes. It's be very, very difficult. Yeah, it's like, an it's like those meetings yeah, that, that you get locked into and everybody's got the donuts and all this like, or it's shit like the, at work. Or the alcoholic who's going to be a bartender. Yeah, yeah he's like, I'm, not gonna, <laughs> I'm not going to drink anymore. Yeah, that's not a good idea. But I'm, yeah. gonna, I'm still going to go to the bar. No, you got to change your environment. Get those foods out of your house. Don't let them be there. Now, if you have family members or roommates that like to eat those foods, and uh, hopefully these people are cool with you, you talk to them and you say, look, I'm trying to change my eating behaviors. If you wouldn't mind, can you keep those foods away from me and just keep them in different cupboards or whatever so that I don't, I'm not exposed? And it, it, it's not a sign of weakness, okay? Again, you have to change your environment so that you can create these new behaviors. At some point, eventually, 
you'll be in a point where you can be around those foods and make better yeah, decisions. Yeah, making uh, like an extra step for you to have to go <laughs> out seeking those foods is is a really big uh, bonus. So that way it's like, you know, I, I will still have cravings. I will still have these things I'm kind of working through in terms of like palatable food like that where I'm just like, in the mm -hmm. middle of the night, I'm like, oh my God, I really want some cookies. But I have to actually drive to the store. Mm -hmm. I, I don't keep them in there at, readily at hand. I, I'm glad you waited uh, this long to bring this one up because I also think it's one of the most challenging and it also includes the people you surround yourself oh, yeah. with. Um, and this is a hard one uh, to, to really to own up on, to make change with. And, and you really have to ask yourself how important uh, these goals are for you or how important it is that you make this healthy lifestyle change. Is it as important that you may have to change the circle or the network of people that you have around you? That's fucking really tough. It mm -hmm. is. And it mm -hmm. sounds tough because I think what people hear right now is that you have to get rid of your friends and family uh, to change your environment. No, it's not true. Your, cl your real friends, the people who really care about you and your family members, are will be a part of this. They'll help you with this. If you, if you have friends that connect with you over eating junk food and that's all you guys have a connection over... You're probably going to have to change. Well, that. a harder one, and I like because few people meet up to eat junk food, right? <laughs> but alcohol. My this fat is a, roommates in college. Alcohol yeah. is a hard one. How many clients have you dealt with that have built relationships around partying and social drinking, and yeah. to try and tell them that you know you know it's not serving you for you this ultimate goal? And it's always one of the hardest things as a trainer to tackle is the client who walks in and they're like, hey, here's all the goals I want. I want to look like this. I want to do this. I want to lose this. I want to gain that. I want to do this. But I don't want to give up Sunday fun day with my girls. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. I don't want to stop my, I don't, you know, I want to give up my wine at Mondays night. Mondays and mimosas. I mean, come right. on. And, it, and it's not that you can't have balance and you can't have alcohol in your life. That's not true whatsoever. We've, we, we drank over this, the holidays. Alcohol is definitely in our, in our lives. But I think that when you, when you've, solidified these relationships and these behaviors that don't serve the goal and then you're attached to them so much it really conflicts with what you're trying to do especially if that's that's you know I, I remember having friends in high school that you know we connected over you know immature things you know like we'd go out and we try and start fights or whatever and at some point I grew up and I'm like well I don't, I don't want to do that anymore and I tell them I don't want to do that anymore and then I realized that's the only thing that we have in common is that we do those <laughs> things together so I've outgrown you. Yeah. This may happen. You may have friends that the only way you connect with them is to go out and eat pizza or go out and drink. And that's the only way you connect with them. That Those are the people you might have to change out of your life. But here's the thing. A lot of your real friends and family are going to be totally fine with you saying to them, hey, I know every yeah. once in a while we go to... If they're not, they're not real friends. That's right. right. So I know you say, hey, I know I'm going to come over for dinner tomorrow night and you and you like to make me that big lasagna dish or whatever, but you know, I'm really trying, I'm changing my life. And say this to <laughs> say this to your friends, just because, you know, as a trainer, I had to learn how to communicate really well to clients. But then later on, I had to learn how to teach my clients how to communicate to their family and friends uh, better as well. So this is this is the ineffective, and then there's an effective way of doing this. So here's an ineffective way of doing it. Hey, look, tomorrow night, I know I'm coming over for, for lasagna, but can you make something different because I'm on a diet? Not effective. It's not effective. Diet is temporary. Your friend may do it once or twice, but eventually they're going to get annoyed with you and be like, ah, get off your diet already. Mm. One time is not going to hurt you. Instead, say this. Hey, I'm changing my life. My lifestyle is going to be totally different now, so... Uh, please, can we, you know, let's have something else together. I'd love to, let me bring some food this time. Much better approach. Well, as I say, I would go about the, do you mind if I bring something because what, I, what I'm trying to do right totally. now is this, or what I'm going to do is this. So I think that's a better approach. Totally. And you, what you're doing is you're, you're, you're communicating a little bit more effectively to them. Now your real friends and family are not going to have a, a problem with this. Now here's the other thing. Don't push your new goals onto them. Yeah. Allow them to be themselves. Here's what's going to happen. If you're strong in what you're doing, they'll actually many times come around. I've, I've influenced quite a few of my friends and family, not by pushing it on them, but by being consistent with myself, asking for their help. Mm -hmm. Eventually, they see what's happening with me, and they say, hey, you know what? I want to do a little bit of what Yeah, what it's interesting because I mean, a lot of times you get really excited about these goals, and you want to tell everybody about it, and you want to build this whole accountability for yourself, but you're just, you're really then like creating this, this environment where you're depending on people. Like this needs to be about you and your intentions and you know, how you want to like 
carry yourself from there on forward. And, and that needs to be, you know, the nexus of what you need to focus on and not focus on how everybody else is yeah. going to be affected around yeah, you. Yeah. Here's another example of changing your environment. I had a client who every morning would drive to Starbucks uh, for coffee and she would go there and she would get a, uh, you know, I don't remember what coffee it was, but it was a well, the frappuccino. Yeah, it was like a high calorie coffee. Plus she would get a frap. Plus she would get like a breakfast sandwich. So I said, okay, you can have your coffee in the morning, but why don't you order it ahead of time? Make sure it's black or whatever and go pick it up or make it at home. Change the environment. You know, get rid of the foods in your house that you know aren't going to be conducive to your goal. Park further from your job. That's your environment. Change it so you have to walk. How about you take your chair at work when you're sitting in front of your desk, take it off, take it out of your your, your cubicle or whatever, move it to the side. Now you have to stand. Change the environment around you uh, because if you don't, it's going to be very difficult to make long-lasting uh, permanent changes. Now, one more thing, uh, and this one's a big one for me. This is people who focus on one metric or one measurement in, in order to gauge their success. Mm. Usually it's the scale. Yep. Weight. All they care about is uh, how much weight I've lost. And if I lost weight, if I'm losing weight, I'm succeeding. If I'm not losing weight, I'm failing. Uh, this was one of my favorite ones to tackle with clients because people would come to me. Of course, I'm a trainer. I know what I'm doing. I'm training them properly. And they wouldn't lose weight initially because, uh, like we're talking about in this podcast, it's a slow process. And they'd say to me, what's going on? I've been working out with you for six weeks and the scale's only gone down one pound. Why am I not losing weight? And I'd say, okay, well, that's one thing that we're going to measure is the scale, but let's talk about some other stuff. How do your clothes fit? Oh, they fit a little bit looser. Okay, that's that's a good thing. How do, How's your sleep been? I think I'm sleeping a little bit better. Great. How's your uh, strength? Yeah, I, I know you're stronger because I'm training you. You're lifting more weight. Um, how's your digestion? Actually, it's a lot better. Phenomenal. How's your, your mood? It's great. And I'd make a checklist and I'd show them and I'd say, Look at all these phenomenal improvements you made in the last six weeks. So focusing on all of the beneficial effects of positively changing your lifestyle, not just on the aesthetic or not just on the scale, because oftentimes the scale will start to reflect all those other things. Uh, you know, when well, you not to mention it, it's a it's an actual terrible way to measure your success. I mean, when a client comes into me and they say, 50, I want to lose 50 pounds on the scale. That is my goal. I want to lose 50 pounds, Adam. I don't want to see five to 10 pounds go off on the scale, especially for the first month or two. My goal is actually to see if I can kind of maintain their weight. Can I introduce, Build muscle burn by can I introduce weight training and start to manipulate their diet to where their weight stays exactly the same and in a, in a month's time, I haven't seen the scale move at all. And that is a mind fuck for somebody who walks in or, or started their New Year's resolution with, I want to lose a number off the scale. Because what I know is that that person, to make their journey much easier to getting to their, their ultimate goal of 50 pounds, speeding their metabolism up is the number one focus that I want to do, which what I know about that is building muscle is going to do that for them. So I don't want to see a bunch of weight come off the scale. Now, what's awesome, and, and it, it would take a lot of convincing for these people to just trust the process and trust what I'm doing with them, is after a month's time, the scale may not move at all, but they feel different. Yes. You know, and, and to your point of all the different markers of energy level, sleeping better, hair, stool, skin, all these things, mood, you know, relationships, all these things are, are positively uh, uh, affected. And then on top of that, they've they've maintained their weight and maybe even seen strength go up in the gym. What I know as a trainer that even though their ultimate goal was to lose 50 pounds on the scale, we're we're flying. We're heading in the right direction, although it doesn't seem like that because yeah. it hasn't changed in the direction that they thought they need to go. I hate the scale as a metric uh, for success. I really don't like it. In fact, I would tell clients to take their scales at home, put it in the closet. Yeah, don't don't weigh yourself. We're not going to weigh. We're not going. I'm not going to let you weigh yourself for the next sixty days. If you had to pick just one metric, if you had to pick just one measurement for success, I would go by strength, strength mm -hmm. in the gym. Because yeah. now it's not perfect. Okay, you want to look at everything. But if you had to pick one, here's why I like strength. You can't do things wrong and get stronger. You can't have poor health and get stronger. You can't have a shitty, terrible sleeping pattern and get stronger. Right. Getting stronger usually means you're doing 
a lot of things right. Maybe not everything right, well, but not a lot of things not right. Well, not only that, but it also carries over to like all goals. If you have a yes. performance goal, if you have a fat loss goal, and obviously if you have a muscle building goal, strength is the foundation of all three and of those. And it's protective. I mean, it's protecting you from like potential diseases and different things down the road too. Strength is, is the pinnacle for you to focus on. Yeah, yeah. So when you get started in the gym uh, for your New Year's resolution, one of the best things you can do is say, okay, uh, my goal – Yo, I'm gonna. These are the behaviors I'm gonna push. I'm gonna try to. I'm gonna go to the gym once a week. I'm going to before going to bed or when I brush my teeth. I'm gonna do ten squats. I'm gonna add an extra ten minutes to you know walking my dog or whatever. And then here's the goal. Here are the goal for the next couple months. I want to get stronger. I want to be able to lift ten more pounds on this exercise. Five more pounds on that. Even one. Even if you want to lose fifty pounds. Uh, especially if you want to lose fifty pounds because that muscle contributes to. A, a faster, hotter burning metabolism. And nothing makes fat loss easier than having a fast metabolism. Obviously. Think of that one friend that you have who yeah. seems to be able to eat whatever they want, doesn't gain a single pound. Wouldn't that be wonderful, right? Wouldn't that be great if you could automatically burn more calories? Well, strength is a great way to measure whether or not that's happening. If it goes up, tends to mean your metabolism is probably getting faster. If it goes down, it, it might mean that your metabolism is actually slowing down. So now you go to the gym and you're just getting stronger. And this is what I would tell clients when they'd come hire me and say, okay, I know you have a weight loss goal, but we're not going to focus on that first. What I want to do first is get you strong. Now this, this conversation would be a little longer. Sometimes I'd have to really convince people, oh, yeah. but once I got them to focus on getting stronger, <laughs> the success uh, that I would have with these people was so much, so much higher. Um, and with that, uh, go to mindpumpfree.com, check out all of our guides and resources. They're all totally free. You can also find the three of us on Instagram. You can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin, me at Mind Pump Sal, and Adam at Mind Pump Adam.